All right, we left off with the end of the ovarian cycle. We did the first part of it. So we're going to conduct a little bit of a review here with you guys. Grace, I've already marked you absent. Where have you been? Um, my class is being moved to testing next to the away. Okay, as I was saying. I'd like you guys to please take a look at this chart. You had this one. The top two are the ovarian cycle and the follicular, the, actually it's just the ovarian cycle. Um, I want you to look at the follicular cycle. What is that little red circle that is being formed inside the larger circle? That is an egg cell. What do we call that larger group of cells that encases the egg cell? That is a follicle, very good. Now this dotted line represents the 14th day. I know that women can have a menstrual cycle or an ovarian cycle that is more or less than 28 days, but 28 days is generally the average. Everyone is different though. But on average, ovulation happens around day 14. The question is, what does, where does this egg cell go once it is ovulated from an egg cell? Or excuse me, once, once it is ovulated from an ovary, where does it go? It goes into a fallopian tube. And eventually, it makes its way to the uterus. So what becomes of this used up follicle now that it no, is no longer housing an egg cell? Do you, do you say it was shed? The follicle does not leave the ovary. The egg cell leaves the ovary. This is an egg cell right there. Where does the egg cell go when it is in the fallopian tube? Where is it trying to get to? The uterus. And if the egg cell does not get fertilized by a sperm, what happens to it? It what? It passes through a menstrual cycle. So my question is, what happens to this used up follicle now that it is no longer housing an egg cell? What do you call it? It's no longer called the follicle. Close. A corpus luteum. And what does it give off, Isabella? It gives off estrogen and progesterone. That's, what I wanted, uh, that's where we left off, okay? So I want to scroll up here. And I want to find the uterus. Where did I put it? Uh, sorry if I'm getting motion sickness if you're watching. Let's see. where to, There you are. Okay. There's the uterus. All right. Now, guys, here's an egg cell, okay? Actually, check that. Here's an egg cell, that little purple thing. And what do we call the tissue that forms around it? Or I shouldn't say tissue. What do we call the group of cells that encases the egg cell while it's developing during the follicular phase? Very good. All right. So what the follicle does is it helps the egg cell mature. Because girls, you are born with all the egg cells that you were ever going to have. But when you start puberty you were able to start making these follicles. And these follicles basically mature your egg cells. And when the egg cells are ready to be released on day 14, they are ovulated. So what we have here is this burst open follicle. And now this egg cell is in the fallopian tube. You're going to learn this today, but I want to see if any of you might know. Do any of you know how long it takes, like how many days it takes for an egg cell to actually go from the opening of the fallopian tube to get into the uterus, it's about six to seven days. Now, here's where everything really ties together. The ovary and the uterus work together. It is happening simultaneously. Now, a moment ago, Isabella, you, you were right on. That burst of a follicle is now something called a corpus luteum. That's what this is. And what hormones is this corpus luteum giving off? Estrogen and progesterone. I want to talk to the males here, if the males even know. You, two, you three better know. Guys, what major hormone comes from your testes? Testosterone. Very good. Ladies, what two hormones come from your ovaries? That's right. And it's actually coming from this. Now, the corpus luteum is inside your ovaries. So when you say it comes from your, your ovaries, you're not wrong but technically is coming from the corpus luteum that is inside your ovaries. But nonetheless, what I want you guys to realize is that these little arrows that I have drawn here, those arrows represent estrogen and progesterone 
secreting from the corpus luteum. Now, I'm going to be repeating myself a lot today because that's how you learn. You just, you hear it over and over. When you memorize a song, you probably have heard the song dozens of times, and then you just memorize it. It happens. So that's why I'm going to be repeating myself a lot. When a female is producing estrogen and progesterone, her endometrial lining thickens. What I'm drawing here is to represent the endometrial lining thickening. Now, because this is thickening, will this egg cell have a place to implant? Alyssa is nodding her head, yes. Isabel is too, yes, it will. So here, you got to really tie all this together. I want you to try to finish my statement. This is going to be cause and effect, okay? Because the corpus luteum is secreting estrogen and progesterone, the endometrial lining of the uterus will what? Now what, Isabel? It will thicken and then maintain, okay? If this egg cell were to be fertilized by a sperm, when that uh, newly formed embryo implants into the wall of the uterus, technically, she's pregnant. Not here, not here, here, okay? Now, what if? I like to deal in what ifs because in, in biology and in medicine, obviously in school, you're taught how things should be, but then you have to problem solve and critically think when things go wrong. People have hormone imbalances all the time. Let's say that you have a woman who is not producing estrogen and progesterone. She has a corpus luteum, but notice I erased my little arrows. She is not producing the estrogen and progesterone. And there's an egg cell right here. And let's just say here's a little sperm cell right there. Sperm cell fertilizes the egg cell. Boom. We have a um, zygote. Okay. And now the zygote is going to start to uh, grow a little bit and become an embryo. How many days will it take for that little embryo to get to the uterus? About six days. At, you know, remember, about six or seven days after ovulation. So we're talking maybe five days or so because it's been it was right here while that is happening okay while this embryo is traveling through the fallopian tube what would you expect to be happening in the uterus while it's making its way to the uterus you would you would hope is doing this it's thickening so the pregnancy can take hold but what if, you know, medicine is all about what ifs. What if this goes wrong? What effect will that have? It's a lot of problem solving. What if she is not producing estrogen and progesterone levels? Her levels are low. What would happen to any endometrial lining in her uterus? Alyssa? It would either shed or it wouldn't even grow in the first place. Let's just say it's not there. Okay. So now... This embryo has made it to the uterus. Where is it going to implant? It's not. It's, good as, it's not going to be able to implant. And so it is shed through the rest of the body, out the cervix, out the vagina. That's what we call a miscarriage. Or at least I shouldn't even say a miscarriage. That's not, is that technically even a pregnancy if it never even implanted? No. She was so technically, here's what happened. A sperm fertilized her egg, but she was never pregnant. Technically, she was never pregnant. It did not implant. And that's what really starts pregnancy is the implantation. Okay, so you guys are going to be hearing a lot about the interplay of hormones, particularly estrogen and progesterone today. I'll mention the other two, FSH and LH. But we're going to finish up the ovarian cycle. And we're going to move into the uterine cycle, okay? I honestly think the uterine cycle is a bit easier, but I want you to uh, start off by looking at this diagram first. Can you tell me what hormone has experiences a massive spike, massive spike in order for ovulation to happen? LH. LH just goes through the roof. And that is what allows the egg cell to burst out of the follicle, to leave the ovary and get into the fallopian tube. If you can prevent that spike, you've effectively prevented ovulation, which is what some birth control pills do. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to look at this half of your uh, chart. I would like you to take a look at this portion. Now on my chart, on this row, I have three lines. 
you have two. I want you to totally ignore the green line. Don't worry about that. You do not have to know that for this class. You do need to know the red one and the blue one. The red one is estrogen. The blue one is progesterone. And I want you to look at the levels of estrogen and progesterone right here. How would you describe their levels, high or low? I would agree. Now, while estrogen and progesterone is low, what is happening at the same time within the uterus itself? The lining is shedding. It is, the thickness is getting thinner and thinner and thinner. It is shedding. And notice how it goes almost all the way down to the, the base. Okay. Now, I want you to look at, at this part. How would you describe the levels of estrogen here? They are increasing. And what do you notice is also happening to the uterine wall? It is increasing. And then look at the progesterone. What happened there? It increased. And notice that the, the thickness of the endometrium is maintaining. So here's what you need to know. Estrogen grows the endometrium. What does progesterone do? Bingo. Maintain it. Progesterone maintains the endometrium. Under what conditions would you want to maintain an endometrium? Right. So that's why some birth controls have very high levels of progesterone. It tricks your body to thinking that it's pregnant. And under those conditions, you'll have a thickened endometrium and you will not ovulate because I want you to look at this um, right here. When estrogen levels are high, LH is high, but also look at the levels of progesterone. How would you describe the levels of progesterone at day 14? Very low. And what hormone is very high on day 14 that causes ovulation? LH. So what if you flipped it? What if you were able to make your progesterone levels way up here? What would that do to your LH levels on day 14? They would get really low. And would you be able to ovulate? Mm -mm. That's the idea. So birth control is just basically manipulating your body chemistry to prevent ovulation rather than to support it. All right. So with that being said, let me look back here. Da, 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 da. If implantation has not occurred in 10 days since ovulation of corpus luteum degenerates, estrogen declines, shed the lining, start over. Okay, great. Um, this occurs when implantation is not All right, let's talk about when you are pregnant. Then uh, we'll pretty much be done. If fertilization does occur. So let's say that you ovulated there was a sperm available and it fertilized the egg cell, what then, all right? If a sperm fertilizes the egg cell, where does this happen? It occurs in the fallopian tube. So it's gonna take several days for it to uh, eventually make its way to the uterus. So the uterus has to get ready for its arrival. If it gets fertilized, the corpus luteum produces estrogen and progesterone. Dylan, you with us? I haven't seen you look up one time. It produces estrogen and progesterone uh, for approximately three months. So I think you might be able to piece this together. If it is producing estrogen and progesterone for three months, is there going to be an endometrial lining when the newly formed embryo is going to reach the uterus? Yeah. And it will implant and the pregnancy should happen. But pregnancies for humans last nine months. And make sure you all know that for humans, it's nine months. But for other organisms, it can be a lot longer. Like I think an elephant is pregnant for more than a year. I think a whale is like a year and a half. So dogs, a few months, every animal is different. Don't just think that humans are the standard. Everything is nine months. It is not, everything is different. Um, so do any of you happen to know 
after three months, what takes over your corpus luteum in producing a lot of estrogen and progesterone? And it's actually something that all of you developed yourself while you were inside your mother. It is in the womb with you. Your placenta. That's right. The placenta takes over the hormone producing duties for the rest of the pregnancy. Okay. That's basically it for the ovarian cycle. So what we learned here is that your ovaries will produce estrogen and progesterone. If you do have a fertilized egg, we call that a zygote. And I'll teach you this tomorrow, uh, probably more so Thursday. The other classes are behind you guys. So tomorrow is going to be really easy for you. Um, but eventually I'm gonna teach you the stages of development from a zygote all the way to a fully formed baby. We're gonna go through all those stages. And something that you'll learn is that the zygote will divide into two cells and then four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 126, so on and so on and so on. Um, that's going to eventually develop into an embryo and then eventually to a fetus. Um, it, and I'll show you how the placenta forms, but all in due time. If the pregnancy does happen, then estrogen and progesterone will continue to be pumped in and it will maintain the, uh, it will maintain the lining for the next nine months. And it kind of gave you a perspective here. I know someone who gave birth in August. She just had her second period last week. So think about that. Think of the math here. She gave birth in August. It is currently May. In April, she just had her second period since her child was born. So it took her uterus about six months to basically recover and reboot itself. Get ready, because some of you have siblings. You have one mom and your mom has had multiple children. A woman can have multiple uh, pregnancies. They're just not gonna happen immediately after the first one. So it took her about six months to just get her hormones, get everything back on track, okay? Um, but we'll go over all that eventually um, when it comes to the hormone ebbs and flows. So let's switch on over to the uterine cycle now. Here we are. The uterine cycle is also called the menstrual cycle. And its activity is very much contingent on the activity of the ovaries. Ovarian hormones regulated. The uterus is where an embryo implants and develops. I just said it about 20 seconds ago. What two hormones regulate the uterus? Where do those two hormones come from? Where's the follicle located? It's not technically a follicle anymore. It's a corpus luteum. So the ovarian hormones which are estrogen and progesterone Regulate the uterus. All right. The uterus is a very finicky organ, even though it is, it is the womb, it cannot get pregnant any time of the day, any time of the week, any time of the month or any time of the year. It happen, has to happen at a very specific time. The uterus is receptive to embryonic implantation, which is when you are actually pregnant.
uh, six to seven days after ovulation. That's it. Guys, getting pregnant is a lot harder than it seems. Oh, you just have sex. You're pregnant. It is. There's so much that has to actually happen. You have to have sex. The sperm has to make it to the fallopian tube. Oh, yeah. By the way, the egg cell has to be in the fallopian tube. The sperm has to fertilize the egg. And then you have to form an embryo. Then the embryo has to go back to the uterus. And then it has to implant. And then this body part has to grow at this time. And then the brain has to grow at this time. Then the bones and the liver, then this digestive system, the nervous system, the heart. Everything has to happen on schedule or things can go horribly, horribly wrong. It is a lot harder than it seems. Only about six to seven days after ovulation is when the uterus is able to take the uh, embryo in. If implantation does happen, if things go right, the endometrial lining will be maintained by the ovarian hormones. You, you should not have your period while you are pregnant. That would almost mean like your body is aborting the, the pregnancy itself. Some women tend to get a little bit nervous if they notice some spotting um, of blood on their clothing if they're, or when they're pregnant. A little bit is not uncommon, but obviously it would, def it would, it would give me cause for concern if I'm supposed to hold on to my endometrium and I'm shedding a few drops out of it. That's the... That's the life force that sustains the, the pregnancy. Okay, so there are, there are three stages of the uterine cycle. There's three phases. And let's go ahead and get to what those three are. I am going to tell you what is happening in the uterus while what we're talking about today is going on in the, excuse me, I meant to say, I'm going to tell you what's going on in the ovaries while we're talking about what's happening in the uterus, all right? So we're going to do a meanwhile in the ovary. So the first phase is going to be from day zero to day four. This is known as the menstrual, uh, menstrual or the flow phase. There's different ways to say that you are on your period. I've heard a couple of them. Maybe you guys could tell me some I haven't heard. Like I got a visit from Aunt Flo today. You get it, Dylan? Aunt Flo flow phase, flowing out of the body. Um, I got a little red present today. You get it, Chris? Red, blood, yeah. Do you guys have any other little subtle ways that you know that I maybe don't know about how you can convey that you were on your period? Shark week? Wow. Yeah, she did. What? Pearl Harbor. Why? Because there's blood in the water? Yeah. Oh, my God. I've heard the one where I can't go to the beach today. I'm like, why not? I might attract sharks. <sighs> ah, gotcha. Shark week. Huh. Okay. I learned something today. Okay. Well, this whole phase is known as menstruation. And the short term for that is the menzies. This is when the uterus sheds the endometrial lining. If the uterus is shedding the endometrial lining, then what hormone, what is the status of the ovarian hormones, estrogen and progesterone? Must they be high or low? They should be low. And if you even look on your diagram, you can see that on the last row where it shows the endometrium being shed, look at the levels of estrogen and progesterone. They should be pretty low. Ovarian hormones. Are low. Okay. How does uh, the endo, I want only the guys to answer this. How does endometrial lining get out of the body? Very 
Very good, Chris. You are the first male to be able to answer that competently today. Someone said through the ovaries. No. Okay, let's think of our anatomy here for a second. The endometrial lining is going to defy gravity, go into the fallopian tube, and then get to the ovary, and then where? Is there like a drain? No. So you are correct. The lining passes through the cervix and out via the vagina. Remember that the vagina has three functions, sexual intercourse, childbirth, and menstruation. Those are the three functions of it. Okay, now, meanwhile, in the ovary, I want you all to please look at the handout that I have provided you. I want you to look at the ovarian cycle. What phase are we in in the, ovar in the uh, ovarian cycle? Days zero through four. In the uterus, the uterus is shedding its lining. What phase are we in in the ovaries? Ovaries. We're in the follicular phase. What is happening to the follicle during this time? It's growing. The that's easily said. The follicle is growing. What is it growing around? Right, it's growing around the egg. If you can't see that, let's look back up at the diagram. Look right here. What I have boxed in, in green is the ovarian cycle. This, what I have boxed in blue, is the uterine cycle. This is what I want you to look at right here. This is the flow phase, what I just circled. Look at how the endometrium is actually shedding. Because it is shedding, you can easily justify what hormones must be at low levels. Estrogen and progesterone, okay? Now, meanwhile, up in the ovaries, what phase are we in? We're in the follicular phase. And as Grace easily said, the follicle is growing. That's all you have to know. All right, let's get back to it. Phase two. This is going to be days five through 14. This is known as the proliferation phase. I want you all to please look at the diagram. What happens to the endometrial lining after it has been shed, but before day 14? So you're looking at the time between it shed and day 14. What is happening to it? It's rebuilding, bingo. That's exactly what I've written. Endometrium rebuilds itself. So what hormone must be on the rise that builds the endometrium? Not progesterone. Progesterone maintains it, estrogen builds it. Estrogen levels are rising. After you have that rain down, I want to go back up. I want you guys to see this for yourselves. Take a look. We're looking at this time period here. Everyone, please look up from here to here. This is the proliferation phase. So if, I, if you want me to actually write this out, this is the menstrual phase. This is the proliferation phase. I asked Isabella, she said, the endometrium is regrowing. That's absolutely right. It's getting bigger. What hormone is causing that? Look at this hormone right here, the red line. Look at that. It is on the rise. Your estrogen levels are rising. Okay. <clears throat> let's see uh, what happens at the what happens in the ovary at the end of the proliferation phase what is that called 
the egg is released. Ovulation. Okay. Oh, I should not erase that. Just keep that where it's put. Okay. Now, um, what was I going to say? This is kind of unrelated to the uterus, but this is just a fun fact. It's sort of related to the uterus. In order to get into the uterus, what do you have to pass through first? You're coming, you're, you're going through the vagina. In order to get to the uterus, what do you have to get through first? Yeah, I, I should have specified. So the cervix is like the gatekeeper on what can and cannot enter the uterus. Well, the, this may sound kind of weird, but the, cer the cervix actually has a mucous membrane and the mucus can be thick, the mucus can be thin. If it's thick, nothing gets in. If it's thin, some things can get in. At this time, the mucous membrane is thin. Now, tell me again, what happens at the end of the proliferation phase? Ovulation, an egg cell is released. Biologically speaking, what, do you, what does the body want to have done to that egg cell? Fertilize. So how, what do you think is happening to the mucous membrane in the cervix? Is it thickening or thinning? And what's it gonna allow through? Bingo. So the cervical mucus thins. This is going to permit sperm passage to the uterus. Okay, now as promised, meanwhile, In the ovary, can you please look and tell me, according to my diagram I did up here, I want you guys to tell me, I don't want to give you all the answers. What is happening to the ovary during the proliferation phase of the uterus? The uterus is in the prolifer proliferation phase. Can you tell me what is happening in the ovary at this very same time? What phase are we in? Days five through 14. We're still in the follicular phase. What is the status of the follicle? It's larger, it's pretty much fully developed. So the follicle is fully developed. What eventually happens at the end of this phase? You have ovulation. Ovulation happens at day 14. Um, the, as the follicle develops, I should have mentioned this, it secretes estrogen. What role does that estrogen have in the uterus? This one's really important. In the ovary, the follicle is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and it is secreting more and more estrogen. What role does that estrogen have on the uterus? That's right, Chris. It is building the endometrium. because there might be a little embryo on the way. Okay, now to show you guys how far ahead you are, my other two classes finished here. We can keep going. Let's go to the fourth and, or the third and final phase of the uterine cycle. This is gonna be days 15 through 28. This is known as the secretory phase, as in secreting. What has already happened if you're at days 15 through 28? Ovulation has definitely happened. Now, has fertilization happened? It depends. Depends if there's been uh, sex or not. It depends if there's been fertilization or not. We don't know. But here's what we do know. The endometrium is getting ready for company, whether the company is going to be an egg or an embryo. The endometrium prepares for an embryo to implant. Most of the time in your lives, ladies, your endometrium is going to be disappointed because let's get real. The majority of your periods, you will not be pregnant. You're only going to be pregnant for maybe a couple of years of your whole life. If you want to have two kids, that's two years of your whole life, pretty much. Um, what is going on in the ovary? 
it is no longer a follicle. What do we got? And what is the corpus luteum producing? Estrogen and progesterone. So not only is the estrogen building the endometrium, what's the progesterone doing? Maintaining it. The corpus luteum secretes estrogen and progesterone further encouraging embryonic implantation. Okay, now we have two scenarios. We did this, we did this a little bit yesterday. Uh, we're gonna talk about fertilization. Some people call this the miracle of life. Some people call this conception. It's when the sperm fertilizes the egg. The, the word sperm literally means seed. So if the seed has, plant, has been planted or not. So let's say that we have no. No fertilization on the left, and then yes, fertilization on the right. Let's do the no route first. If there has been no fertilization, what will happen to the corpus luteum? We did this yesterday. If there is no fertilization, the corpus luteum degrades. If the corpus luteum degrades, what happens to the hormones that it secretes? It starts to go down. Estrogen and progesterone levels drop. And what does that lead to? Think of the uterus. We're on the uterine cycle. Think of the uterus. Shedding is going to get prepared. Menstruation is prepped. Girls, the first day of your cycle where you are on your period, that is actually day one. The first day of your period is day one of your entire cycle. All right, well, let's do, let's say that the fertilization does happen. What happens to the corpus luteum? The corpus luteum stays put, it prevails. And if it prevails, it continues to produce estrogen, whoops, estrogen and progesterone. And if everything does go as it should, implantation is supported. Now your uterus cannot force implantation to happen. Let's make that very clear. Implantation is where it happens it's not forced. Like learning takes place in this school. I cannot force you guys to come to school. You're supposed to, but let's be real. I can't force you. The uterus cannot force an embryo to implant into the uterus. It's where it wants it to be, but it can't force it. So let's just say it's going to be supported. I support you come to school. A uterus supports an embryo implanting into the uterus. All right. So that is about it when it comes to the stages of the uterus. What I want to finish up today's class with girls is, and guys, is what does estrogen and progesterone do for you besides your ovaries and besides your uterus? It has a big, big role in puberty as a whole. Okay. So let's finish off today's class with about nine minutes left on what actually estrogen and progesterone does for you as a whole, as a whole person, not just as a reproductive system. So we have the role of estrogen and progesterone. These hormones are called the generators of sexual activity. If you're watching this video, you hear a subtle humming. There's apparently some construction going on next door. Okay, well, some things that we already did know, 
is that these hormones promote oogenesis. What is oogenesis? Creation of egg cells. It promotes oogenesis and follicle, oops, follicle growth. Where does oogenesis and follicle growth take place? It occurs in the ovaries. I hope that's construction. I mean, that is the bathroom next door. It might be somebody having a little backfire from the school pizza. It also promotes the maturation of the female's reproductive system. It makes the uterus prepared for pregnancy, like capable of pregnancy, I should say. When I say it is the maturation of the female reproductive system, girls, when you are six, your uterus cannot be a womb. It's not capable. When you're 16, yeah, it could. When you're 10, no. When you're 20, yeah. So it just makes your reproductive system go from being incapable of supporting your pregnancy to capable of supporting your pregnancy. All right, now let's discuss estrogen. Estrogen supports bone growth spurts at puberty. Girls actually grow up faster than boys do because girls grow up faster. Boys grow longer. Like it takes longer for boys to grow because there's just much more growth there. Um, Girls typically grow at about 11 or 12 years old. That's when they really start. Girls grow more quickly than boys. It's usually at 11 or 12 years old. But here's the downside. I remember this growing up myself. You guys may remember too. The girls that are your age, they hit puberty before boys do, like a year or two before boys. So while boys are so short and had the, hi, my name is Chris, little girly voice, the girls are growing up and the boys are almost left in the dust. They have to wait a couple of years to catch up. Here's the downside though, girls, you do grow up first, but your growth, uh, the growth plates in girls uh, close faster. That's the downside. So pretty much girls, you reach your full height by about 13 to 15 years old. So I would say by the time you hit your sophomore year, you're done. Sorry, Grace. Really? How old are you? Whoa. Get taller shoes. Almost five one. Look at you go. So boys, if you're wondering how long, when are you done growing? About 19. That's when you're done. Okay, um, finally, let's wrap things up here. I got you for four more minutes. Estrogen promotes the development of breasts, um, subcutaneous fat in hips and breasts and the development of wider and lighter pelvis. Like there's an old expression, childbearing hips. That's what that's all about. And this will be my last entry for you guys today. During pregnancy, estrogens and progesterones come from the placenta. All right, and that is all for today.